I'm pleased to introduce our first panelist, Josh Blackman. He's an assistant professor of law at the South Texas College of Law. He's authored a dozen articles on various issues in constitutional law. Earlier this year, he published a critically acclaimed book titled Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare. In his spare time, uh, Professor Blackman has created the first online Supreme Court Fantasy League for law nerds everywhere, uh, fantasyscotus.net. Uh, he's Thanks presenting to work today on the anatomy of legislative reactions to mass gun violence. Professor Blackman. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. First, I want to point out my co-author, Shelby Baird. Shelby, stand up. Hi, Shelby. Okay. So this is a very important, timely topic, and it's especially timely that we're right here. Is there feedback? Do you hear feedback? Okay, I'm sorry. I got some. All right. This is a very important, timely topic uh, for a very important reason. It seems that every so often these shootings happen, and these somehow come out of the blue, and afterwards there's really just this kind of visceral reaction of what happens, and it follows something predictable pattern. I can sketch it out uh, like this, you know, um, breaking news that some unknown number of victims were killed by gunfire at a school or a park or some public place. Uh, we see that this perpetrator took these lives wantonly. Um, the police arrive, sometimes a perp is captured, sometimes he's killed, often by suicide. Um, there's often sadness after this happens, and this often gives way to uh, fervor for change, which I guess Governor Malloy uh, spoke a few uh, moments ago. Uh, different proposal or advance, some of these ideas were advanced before and failed, some of them haven't. Um, but as time progresses, support for these laws, perhaps not in Connecticut, but on the national scale, fades. Okay? Uh, many of these laws which didn't have support before the tragedy don't have support afterwards. So what the article Shelby and I are working on looks at is this shooting cycle what we call it. It's to understand how governments react and respond to these mass shootings. So in order to do this, I have to do a few definitional things. First, we have to define what a shooting is, because it's actually a difficult thing to define. Um, second, we have to look at how legislators respond to these shootings. And finally, we talk a little bit about the media and the social aspects of how various elements of society uh, uh, build into this feedback loop. So first, this might surprise you, but there is no good definition of what a mass shooting is. Uh, depending who you ask, it's either four shooting, uh, four deaths in one incident or three. Um, and what actually might surprise you even more is that these are surprisingly and stunningly rare. So for every, just break it down, for every 1,000 people killed by firearms every year, mass shootings responsible effectively for 0.1. Okay? These, these are effectively very rare instances, but they're very sensationalized. Um, and I think the reason why this was sensationalized is something called the availability, her availability heuristic. Maybe you read Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman. There's this notion that things that are very salient grab our attention. For example, shark attacks, right? We all are afraid of shark attacks, but they're so rare, and they never happen. So people tend to react to them. And even a, a publication like Mother Jones, which is very liberal, uh, they were only able to count about 66 mass shootings since 1983. Now, I say only. But when you put that in the context of the large number of deaths by firearm, it's actually a very, very small sliver. It's roughly 0.1%. Um, even if you increase it to four or more killings in one incident, it's only 0.6%. Um, so it's like less than one-fifth of 1% 1 of all murders in the U.S. involve four or more victims. Okay? Uh, also, the majority of killings actually involve not random shootings, but what are called familicides, which are effectively someone who knows someone else and it kills it. There's background. There's history. Uh, that's overall all many. The other number I want to discuss is, is there a trend? Is there a growing trend in mass shootings? And the answer is emphatically no. Um, whenever there's a mass shooting, someone goes on TV and says, you, we're seeing more and more of these. Uh, we see Sandy Hook, we see Tucson, we see uh, uh, LAX. But if you look at over the last 90 years, the rates remain almost exactly the same. It's roughly about 26, 27, 28 a year in a, fluctu uh, a decade. It fluctuates a little bit, but they're uh, largely the same. Um, even as far as school shootings, even factoring Columbine, uh, uh, the, the, the rate has been roughly the same. Um, and just to put this in perspective, uh, there are about, on average, maybe 20 deaths per year on college campuses. Okay? About 1,000 deaths on college campuses per year from suicide. About 1,500 deaths on college campus from binge drinking and alcohol abuse and drug, drug overdoses. So to put that in perspective, these are, these are somewhat small numbers of the amount of life that's lost um, uh, over ours. And to give you another example, we often speak about... Uh, um, accidental deaths by firearm, there are about 1,000 of those a year. Um, 3,500 children each year are killed by drowning in pools. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't mean to be callous, but I think in the policy debate, we have to keep these in perspective. I think what you'll find is my agenda is actually concerning if not just the victims of mass shootings, but the victims of all firearm crimes. 
Um, I think this, this innate effort to focus on the sensational really forgets a lot of other people. So for example, uh, I'm going to give you some recent events. We all know that there was a, about a person killed in LAX about a couple weeks ago. But did you know that, um, let me get the exact number, did you know in the same month of October, there were, uh, let's see, what's the number? Yeah, so in the month of October 2013, the same month of that shooting, there were 220 people killed in Los Angeles. Um, I tried Googling all of each of their names for any kind of mass news, I couldn't find anything. Uh, for example, did anyone know that shortly after Sandy Hook, there were 16 uh, 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 people killed in Chicago? Um, there was a Mother's Day shooting in New Orleans where about 16 or 17 people were killed. Um, I, I could go on and on. Uh, even this past week, my hometown of Houston, there were two teenagers shot at a house party, which maybe read about, maybe didn't. Um, and I think this raises the important question, which we should really be asking ourselves, why are some deaths gaining so much attention, but others don't? Um, and, and I think it has something to do, again, with uh, what's been called the availability heuristic, or also the in-park uh, phenomenon, right? And we have a couple reasons why I think certain uh, uh, types of uh, uh, mass shootings uh, elicit so much response. So, so the first reason is that we tend to relate to people who are like us, right? We tend to have concerns with those who resemble us. And I don't just mean wealth or race, I mean people we can relate to. So if there's a shooting at a school, you say, oh man, my, my son goes to school or I went to school, you can relate to that. When there's a shooting in the south side of Chicago and some kid gets killed in a drug deal gone wrong, that empathy is not the same. I think Governor Malloy actually addressed that when he said there's a racial undertone, and I, I think there certainly is. Um, there's also a, a, a principle called in-group in bias, this notion that when people are in our group, we have more sympathy for them, okay? I, I think another issue actually has to do more, more specifically with race. Um, it, it's, it's indisputable that when we see missing children reports, for example, right? If there's a, a white child who goes missing, it's actually a, a, a four-long fire and people go panicking. And there's similar instances where, where African-American children go missing and people simply don't react, okay? I think one of the other reasons, and, and this is getting more policy side, is that those who are advancing gun control legislation see mass shootings as a vehicle to promote change. And I don't think they're, they're afraid to that. I think they're very much open to saying when there's a mass shooting, that's when they ramp up their activity. And that might be good or bad, uh, but I think what these groups have realized is that when you actually try to eliminate the single most dangerous firearm in the United States, which is the firearm, right? If you count the number of deaths by gun, the AR-15 is nowhere even near the top. It's the semi-automatic pistol, the handgun, which is the most commonly used gun in the United States. I think the Brady campaign obviously have recognized long ago that they can't get rid of those. So they focus on these sensational killings with these uh, sensational guns that look like military weapons, right? And even if you ban the AR-15, the AK-47, you're still going to only eliminate a very small chunk of firearm deaths. And I say this as someone who supports the Second Amendment. Um, if you actually want to get rid of gun violence, you'd have to ban handguns. There, there's no other way of saying it. But that's not going to happen. And instead, they focus on these mass shootings with a very small percentage of killings with a weapon that has a very small range. Um, most shootings, uh, individual homicides, require one or two bullets. No magazine capacity will ever limit that. Right? Even if you limit yourself to seven rounds, one's enough, two's enough, okay? I, I also think there's, there's almost kind of a, uh, uh, almost like a morbid curiosity in violence, and, and I, I blame the media much for this. Now, in many contexts, the media shows restraint. When there's certain kinds of sexual crimes or sexual violations, they don't publish those of details. But when there's a mass shooting, they fetishize it. They go wall to wall, and they give so much attention to these sick, these sick bastards, excuse the French, but they give so much attention to these sickos. And, and there's something called a copycat phenomenon, which you probably studied. If you go read the journal of Columbine, you go to uh, some show, uh, a guy in Virginia Tech, they basically glamorize these former shooters. And by giving so much attention to these evil people, they actually glamorize them and give the details. For example, the Navy Yard shooting, they actually released video of this guy walking through the halls with his rifle. They don't need to release that. It serves absolutely no public purpose, but the media sensationalizes it because it gets ratings. It's disgusting. And I think it's dangerous. And I think some restraint would actually facilitate and, and reduce the amount of crime, okay? So, so where do we go from this? Well, we talk about the legislative response. Uh, Shelby and I have done actually some research on this. We looked at federal legislation. Do you think that if gun violence goes up, right, Congress would want to pass more laws to reduce it, okay? But that's not what happens. When does Congress pass more laws? When there are mass shootings. Even when you see normal trends of gun violence going up, Congress does nothing. They only do stuff when there's mass shootings. So my simple contribution is to kind of rethink how we approach gun control. I say this as someone who supports gun rights. 
you're focusing on the wrong things. I, mean, I realize this is Connecticut, this is a tough thing to say here, but by focusing on such a small, narrow sliver of gun violence, you're ignoring 99.9% .9 of people killed by guns, and that's a serious problem. The debate is not in the right place. Um, and and I, Shelby and I are working actually on a state-by-state -state analysis, but preliminary research shows similar things in California, in Colorado, and uh, uh, we're doing Connecticut as well, we're not done with the research there, but there's a notion that you're trying to prevent the unpreventable when the preventable is right there. The crimes we know about are there. You know, drug crimes are there. Uh, different, different pony, but legalizing drugs, that would save a lot more lives than banning AR-15s, right? If you legalize simple possession, that would save so many more lives than getting rid of AK-47s having magazine clips. There's so many other things we can do if we actually concern about death. But I fear that the policy being driven by this has other motivations. And, and this is where the Brady campaign's history, I think it was originally called the campaign to ban handguns. George, is that the official name? Or? Uh, handguns and trolling. Handguns and trolling, they changed that name because they realized early on they couldn't do that. So they went to these military looking mm -hmm. weapons, they created this phrase called the assault rifle, which doesn't actually mean anything. It has you know, these little bayonet lugs and doesn't actually matter. But it, it, it's an effort to use these fear, this mass bloodshed, which I think is almost, it's almost like the gladiator times that we had this like, uh, uh, dis it's disgusting. Um, so in sum, I want to help all people who are victims of gun crimes, not just people who are victims of, of, of mass shootings, the people who deserve a lot of help, but there's a lot of other people, racial tensions, geographic tensions, inner city tensions. This is a problem of the entire United States, and the debate should focus on that and be honest and not just simply say we want to ban these militaristic weapons. We should be forthright with what, what the gun control people want to do, and then I, I think the program people might have a more engaged debate. And I look forward to hearing from my panelists for the uh, rest of the discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks, Professor Blackman. Our next speaker is George Moxery, an assistant professor of law at the Southern Illinois University School of Law.